for all the reasons that uh, some of you very well, the lunch is very, very good. Um, what we've got now uh, to finish up is one more session of content uh, for you, and then I'm going to hand over to Chris, who will talk about the logistics of um, the feedback session, where we think that the sort of group of you guys actually say, okay, what does all this mean, and how interesting is this? And where would you like help from other arts organisations or from associations and associated groups uh, like Tech UK, the, the group I run? Um, <clears throat> so, without uh, further ado, let me introduce Jaunty today. Paul, delighted that you could come. Jaunty, Jaunty is director of BBC Arts at the BBC, and uh, he's going to talk about uh, uh, BBC uh, approaches to things, particularly when you deal with commissioning and. Um, that sort of thing, but also update on space. And just uh, a comment from me, we represent a lot of the tech industry. We have uh, you know, a lot of media players in that, the Google's, Facebooks, uh, etc. But we are very much on record as saying what a fantastic institution and fantastic vehicle, platform, whatever terminology you want to use, the BBC is for the tech industry. And I think Okay, so you know, we definitely are saying to the government, I think let's, let's take the BBC out of the new uh, future, but, you know, hands off, it's a great thing, so let's keep it going. John, do you have a Great, thank you. Very okay, nice. Uh, I'm terrified we're all going to fall asleep because we're all at lunch now and we're going to So, um, uh, I'm going to ask some questions to you all. We've turned the heating down. We've turned the heating We've turned the heating down. We've turned the heating down. So, uh, I'm John T. Claypool. I'm Director of Arts at the BBC. I'm also Chair of Home um, in Manchester um, as well. Um, what? Why, I'll just very quickly sort of give you an overview of some of the, some of the things I do. Then I, I'll start to do an update on the space, which I will um, do as well. And then I thought it might be useful, just because I have a commissioning role on the space and through BBC as well, I thought I'd just give um, highlights and things I've learned around digital content over the last kind of 18 months, because it's been a big learning curve for me. And I'm, I'm sure some of the points I'm, I'm going to say are uh, sort of obvious to you, but um, uh, they sort of weren't to me two years ago, so I think they sort of bear repeating and, and talking about as well. Just a quick caveat, I'm, uh, up to, um, I'm probably the world's worst PowerPoint presenter. I got a bit trigger happy at Christmas and again experimenting, and so I kind of loved the throwing together last minute PowerPoints, but I was told by my business partner the other day that um, my PowerPoints are aesthetically redundant and tell, um, tell illogical narratives. So, um, <laughs> anyway, here goes. <laughs> so far, so good. Uh, Jonathan Tainbaugh, Director of Arts at the BBC. Um, most of what um, I'm involved in is uh, broadcast commissioning, production, and strategy, but obviously, increasingly, digital is a bigger and bigger part of um, my portfolio. Um, around two years ago, we launched BBC Arts Online. Uh, BBC didn't really have an art site before then. Uh, so we, st um, we started this two years ago. It kind of aggregates uh, existing BBC content, but we do a lot of extra content with, um, with partners and bits of co-publishing and so on. Uh, it's been it's been a sort of, uh, it's sort of evolved as it's gone on. Um, I'm just going to ask a question. How, how many hits do you think we get a week? How, how many visits do you think the BBC gets a week for its art site? Anyone want to? Unique visits? Yeah, unique. Go on, say anything. Five million. Five million. Anyone come back to that, please? Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, something else I've been involved in the last year is uh, Digital started with What Next, uh, who I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, and the BBC, it, it's, and there's sort of about, uh, sort of over a thousand arts organisations around the country who have uh, signed up. It's basically about putting a spotlight on everyday creativity around Britain. Uh, we set it up as a website inside of BBC Arts Online, 
But actually, the, the thing that's worked best of all has been connecting content with the BBC homepage and also BBC local services. And what's worked really well are uh, when through the campaign we've um, gathered stories of everyday creativity and then been able to put a kind of spotlight on that in a way that's hopefully inspiring for others. So our favourite example, um, there was a man in County Durham called, uh, called Ken who uh, went to the Bowers Museum and copied, he was uh, uh, copied a, um, a candle, uh, painting by Canaletto. He was 83 years old, um, a, a retired welder, and he sent his first ever um, tweet, over, uh, and it was hashtag get creative, uh, here's my Canaletto. And then, because it was such a lovely story and the painting was so good, we had it on the homepage within a, a few days. And then two weeks later, he was on the sofa of the one show, <laughs> next to Derek Jacobi, four million people watching him, no longer Ken, but Kenny Leto. So it was a, <laughs> <laughs> it was a nice transformative, um, transformative story. The, um, so I was asked to do update on the space. Um, I'm not, I was, uh, over the last year, we did uh, some reshaping of the business plan around this space, and I was uh, acting chair for six months doing that. I'm not on the board anymore, but I play a kind of commissioning role from the, from the BBC side. But I know there's a lot of, or there has been a lot of confusion around the, uh, the space in the past. I hope it's been slightly to sort of clear up and become clearer over the, the last few months. But I'll just run through very quickly sort of what it is um, and what it's doing. It was originally set up by the Arts Council and the BBC. Um, there's a memo from about 2010 saying uh, to the, both organisations should embark on a project to use digital technology to, one, increase access to, to the arts, um, two, to encourage innovation and creativity in the online space, and then three, to help build capacity in the sector to, to, um, to do those things. Uh, it was launched as a website in 2012 during the Cultural Olympiad and it had a fairly successful pilot run. Um, and it was felt there was a lot of promise there. Uh, it relaunched again in 2014. Uh, what we found by early 2015 was that essentially the kind of traffic hit a glass ceiling. It, uh, it was very hard to bring enough traffic to the site to justify the return on investment that was going in. And that led to a review of the business model which I was involved with over uh, six months, which shifted the focus away from being a website. Um, it was felt that the, that the act of feeding a website and keeping it alive was taking up too much energy. It would rather just keep the funding into commissions, direct um, commissions. So the, uh, the business plan has been shifted to, to this. It's not a website anymore. It's a development and commissioning fund um, to, uh, to go to third party uh, organisations, arts organisations, to produce content they wouldn't otherwise uh, make. And, and we've, um, we've sort of put it through three commissioning lenses. We talk about capture, so content which is essentially capturing sparks that could keep going on, whether that's performance. Uh, then we talk about extending existing arts programmes, so um, taking something your organisation is doing and doing some digital contextualisation around that. Uh, and then we talk about landmarks, which is bespoke um, sort of new projects that exist purely um, in, the online, uh, in the online space. The website now is uh, it's basically sector-facing. It's not really an audience-facing site. It's kind of there to give information about the open calls. What we've done with BBC is set up a model where every project will get distribution on a BBC platform. So um, that might be through BBC Taster, uh, which is our R&D um, service if it's quite a complex type project. Uh, it, it'll almost certainly be through BBC Arts Online, which I showed you at the start. Uh, and we're also looking to get as many of the captured projects onto broadcast um, as possible as well as, as kind of BBC acquisitions afterwards. That is a non-exclusive um, uh, relationship. So the idea is that content that organisations make should go as far and wide as they can possibly take it. So YouTube, Tumblr, wherever. But the BBC offers up a platform to, to get it going. Um, the space team is now fully based in Phase New Studios in Birmingham. Uh, Fiona Morris is the new CEO. Fiona Allen, formerly of the Curb and Leicester, now the Curb Drone is chair. And we just announced uh, the board, the new board, about uh, two weeks ago, 
which is a cracking board. Um, it's Martin Green from Whole City of Culture, Ed Humphrey from BFI, Liz Rosenthal from Power to the Pixel, Andrew Miller from Royal Welsh College of Music, Tim Fleming from Nesta, and Johnny Turkey from Maverick TV. So I think that's a really strong um, and exciting board. Um, what we've been doing in the kind of last three or four months, we're starting to um, just pilot some of the projects in, in this new mod as well, just to have examples that we can, uh, we can show people. Um, this is just how a project can sit within BBC Arts Online. Uh, this was the Bellary Street Theatre, 10th anniversary concert a few months ago. Uh, and so essentially the, the space does a takeover of the front of BBC Arts Online for uh, a period of time. And that was a stream of the concert, a live stream, but with extra context going on and social media um, around that. Um, there was a very interesting project last summer during the Manchester International Festival. Um, and it was a co commission with the Man Manchester International Festival. With, who, who can tell me who this is? FK Twigs. Very good. Yeah. FK Twigs. Um, and uh, it was a project, it was a commission that uh, sat entirely on social media um, with its main platform through Tumblr, which, which is quite interesting. It's something that was essentially a social media work of art. Um, in fact, I can't really describe it, you have to sort of see it because it's, um, because I have to find the Jurassic Brain art content. So it was something that, uh, that felt just kind of very different and, and, uh, and new to me. Um, the interesting thing about it was that because the Commission sat on social media, um, in promotional terms it went through, we think, around 15 million um, sort of Twitter accounts, and we certainly know that over 100,000 came, came specifically to look at the project where it sat for a while, so, um, um, sort of where it sat. So it was just, a, for us, that was quite an interesting thing about how we can use social media and start to um, support art on sides of social media. Um, Another example, we just um, launched this. Um, I should stop saying we because the space is a third party and I'm no longer on the board. But the space launched this last month. Uh, it's a um, uh, virtual reality tour of the IWA exhibition for anyone who, who couldn't go, which we did with the Royal Academy uh, and just went up um, uh, 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 sort of last month. Um, it's had around. We've, um, we think, Colombo has got to be so careful talking about traffic, but we think it's had 60,000 visits in the, in, in the last month. Most of the traffic has been driven from the BBC, um, from BBC sites. Uh, but the exciting thing is the largest audience segment has been uh, 18 to 35 year olds, which is quite, uh, quite encouraging. Um, and then the sort of final um, project that I just want to share is, this is Modern Ballet's 1984, through the space, um, the space uh, filmed it with them, uh, BBC Four was taking it as an acquisition and it's playing this Sunday night on BBC Four. And that's just an example of quite a simple caption project, but one which I think has a lot of value, uh, and a lot of value for some of us in this room, and that's a big focus for the space over the next couple of years as well. Um, we, the first commissioning round of the sort of new model uh, it closed uh, about a month ago and the announcements around that will be happening soon and then there'll be another open call happening um, uh, happening uh, sooner, sooner enough as well, so it's worth keeping an eye out. Um, and just because that's quite a lot of information, I just arranged an intermission at this point. Is there any questions about space? It's sort of worth doing now, but, uh, before, but before, before I move on. So are there any questions about that? Very good. I was clearly amazingly clear and uh, <coughs> concise. Okay, so the sort of next thing I wanted to do, I just thought I'd share um, four things that I think about a lot, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure they're sort of quite obvious to you, but they're things I increasingly, increasingly feel about um, about um, arts and, and digital technology. Um, the sort of first thing I just, uh, I just thought, put, beware of the website. So. As we know, discovery is becoming uh, phenomenally difficult, and I think most of us as, uh, as users are increasingly dependent on quite large global aggregators to, to find things. And, and I think it's increasingly difficult for smaller organisations to get return on their investment for their, for their websites in terms of drawing the right amount of um, traffic. And um, 
getting increasingly, you still see a lot of beautifully sort of crafted websites, and that's right for some organisations, but you know, but for other organisations, it, it's not necessarily, and it's not necessarily the kind of right use of, um, of, of sort of resource. Um, who, who can tell me what this picture is representing? Any fascists in the room? Sirens. It's the sirens. So I thought I would have the sirens sitting on the rock embodying the website. <laughs> and then there's kind of movable, movable modern content here floating merrily around. So it's in trying to resist being sucked into the rocks of the, um, the, rocks of the, of the website. But um, <laughs> it's like a creepy Victorian picture, I don't know. But, but it's interesting that the space, as I said, kind of hit a glass ceiling in terms of the audience that it was able to drive. Um, and BBC Arts Online, I want to come back to, 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 to that figure I asked for earlier. So um, BBC Arts Online is a site that has the benefit of on-air promotion happening quite a lot, of the homepage pushing towards it. BBC Arts Online has a lot of support from the rest of the, um, the, rest of the BBC its services. It's around the monthly unique is, is under half a million, which is quite, and that, that and there was a, um, there was a, a report done a few months back, I think commissioned by Bill Burdett, um, Bill Burdett Coots, by MTN, who are consultants, um, and they felt, and their conclusion was that BBC Arts Online was the kind of largest special arts provider in the UK. I don't know if that's true, but that's what they were su suggesting. If you think about it, that's quite small. Uh, and it's certainly small compared to other BBC services. And that's uh, something like BBC Arts Online has kind of everything backing it as well. Um, so I think sort of many of us know this. I think it's one of the challenges is that a lot of organisations have boards um, who, who tell their digital teams that their job is to kind of drive traffic to their websites. And that's quite a behavioural thing to to try and um, to try and shift because if you're obsessing about the traffic to the website, you're set up to fail uh, and expectations. It means that digital can be done as or DD prioritised, and it means we can quite often get stuck in a kind of R and D loop where we can never quite get the investment we want to do to do the ambitious things we want to do. Um, and it's it's about sort of working with our boards to to convince them that our digital strategies shouldn't just be so website focused. Um, and that we should be using resources on kind of nimble content that we can send off to, to different places. Um, I mean, as I said, I thought the Wigmore Hall presentation was fascinating, and that's an example of an organisation where there is an immense benefit in having a website. But I think it's always just worth stopping and thinking, what is the point of the website? If it is just to give information and keep it as simple as, as possible. I don't know if that, if that sort of resonates at all, or uh, it's just something I think about. A lot. Um, I just want to come to uh, content, um, and, and once again, this is something I sort of uh, increasingly feel, which is just about the importance of simple, simple formats. I think because digital is, is sort of modern, it's the future. There's a temptation to reinvent the wheel in every project, and, and I think particularly arts organisations. Uh, can often feel that they need to overcomplicate things because they, they need to do something artsy and form as well as in content. And I, for one, have had quite a few dissatisfying experiences over the last 18 months with sort of 360 or inter you know, interactive videos um, and things described as games which aren't games. I like playing games a lot, and for me, games generally involve shooting things. Uh, and uh, a lot of kind of arts games feel like the game we used to get to do on Glasgow School of Latin Hangman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I suspect most of us actually probably engage with the same simple formats again and again and again online, which is kind of social media, text and photograph, video, audio, and sort of podcasts. Um, and that's kind of it really. And then and again, and so that should sort of tell me something. The one area I think this is going to get bigger and bigger is VR, a virtual um, reality, just simply because some of the um, um, experimental experiences I've, I've had to go on are just kind of mind-blowing, so it feels like that's clearly going to go somewhere. Um, just a, a slightly different area of content, I just thought it'd be worth sharing some audience research that the BBC did recently, and it was just a bit of research around what we call knowledge providers, so that's kind of companies like Vice or BuzzFeed who are essentially producing content that is um, 
this form of knowledge. And I just thought, I, I just uh, uh, sworn and thought it would be quite useful to share because we were looking at what type of content gets the most traction, gets shared the most, uh, gets the most hits. Um, and, and they nearly all have the same core subject at the heart of them. Anyone want to guess what the most popular subject is? Cats. Cats. No. <laughs> uh, almost. It's ourselves. It's me. People are most interested in me. Well, not me, personally. <laughs> um, so, so the most popular types of content are things around improving ourselves. Uh, secondly, around understanding our minds and ourselves. Thirdly, astonishing and, and um, astonishing and emotional real stories. And then fourthly, understanding what shapes our history in the future. Just all, so, and, and all those things are things which give you as a user a sense of agency. They give you a sense, it's not passive, they're things that give you a sense of agency. Um, we also just looked at what successful providers have, have in common, which is quite, so, so we looked at Vice and BuzzFeed and everyone, and we sort of found four things that most of the really successful content providers have in common. Uh, and the sort of first is um, utility. They're, they're asking a clear need. There's a clear appetite or thing that they're delivering. Um, the second was a clear target audience, uh, that vice. Everything about vice, they know who their audience is. Um, the third is just around the core format, you know, just TED, just a very simple core format. And then the fourth was around authored content, so opinion, which once again, vice is very good at. Um, <coughs> The first thing that's on my mind at the moment is, um, uh, is topicality. So, you know, most of the content I'm involved with is sort of mid-range content. It, it's, it, it's stuff that's neither completely invisible, but nor does it go viral. And that's quite, that's quite a tricky place to be, because generally content is either invisible or viral. And the thing that separates them, the thing that, may, that makes something go viral is, is topicality. It's ability to occupy the now. And I was, um, uh, I've been thinking a lot about topicality recently, and then I just want to, I don't, so, so last month when David Bowie died, and just everywhere was David Bowie, sort of on television, broadcast, online, word of mouth, everyone, everyone was, was sort of talking about this. Uh, on Arts Online, we just found an old bit of archive from 1965 of David Bowie, age 16, just interviewed as a member of the public, complaining about prejudice against people with long hair. And so we just put it up, and it, you know, several million people looked at that, and it's like the most successful piece of content we've ever sort of put there. But what I was really struck by was that for all of this kind of norms, I didn't think anyone was saying anything interesting about David Bowen. I, I, I just kept hearing the same stuff, which is he challenged gender in the 70s and then he kind of authored his own death and, uh, you know, there we are. And, and it, it, you know, it just made me think that at that moment, if somebody was quite savvy or somebody was doing something creatively or a creative response to that moment, there was a potential audience there of many, many millions. Um, and it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's like Shakespeare said, that all the world's a stage, and it's sort of come true. The problem is it's quite difficult to get anything good onto the stage, or it's sort of crushed out by other things. Um, I just pulled from Google uh, a few days ago the top trending things, and you just saw, you know, Lantern Festival, uh, the Chinese Lantern Festival was, was sort of very big earlier this week. And you sort of think if somebody, an artist had just done something quite quickly, which was connected with the Lantern Festival, could very quickly uh, start to get sort of millions of people engaging with it. Um, and it's just made me think that as, also, that as arts organisations, we tend to think quite long term and we can plan long term. But today's information market is very short term, uh, which uh, needs and requires different ways of engaging and creating. Um, and that sort of you know, if we can create content, if you, if you, you know, if you want it to go viral, it's either got to kind of respond to the news or, or sort of make the news and create it, otherwise it can get lost. So I was uh, I just like the idea of topicality as a kind of arena that you can drop things into, uh, and topicality is a kind of space. Um, and then the sort of final thing um, that I just uh, increasingly feel uh, is just the importance of collaboration. So. Um, I, I, I just increasingly feel that the only way we can really get traction in what we do and the only way that we can really present a kind of alternative to 
the global giants is by working together. And then unless we collaborate, we basically just get swallowed up, our content gets swallowed up and um, disappears. And uh, I'd just sort of be interesting to um, RDK launch yesterday. Uh, so it used to be North Paintings. Um, and it relaunched yesterday, Art UK. I think this is one of the most, um, I think, well, I think it's a great success story. Um, the BBC was involved with it, but it's, 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 it was led by the Public Capital Foundation. Um, it's, it's sort of just worked away quietly over kind of six years, and it's, its ambition was to get every painting in public ownership in the country onto the same site. Um, and it's had, over 3,200 venues who have been uh, digitising and uploading their artworks. There's over 200,000 artworks. 80% um, of those artworks aren't on public display, so it's serving a, a, um, a clear need. And um, the traffic is around, uh, it's, it's sort of over 300,000 uniques a month, so, so it, it does well. And I, and I just think it's been an amazing example of quite a long-term collaboration that took a while to gain momentum. Um, Andy Ellis, who, who, who sort of uh, who, who leads it, was saying yesterday at the launch that the whole thing from inception has cost six million, which is the price of a lot of you know, single paintings in an auction, and yet spend six million over as many years and get every single painting in public display onto a single place. I, I, I think it's a great example of collaboration in action. Um, I, I'm very interested in sort of content pilots that start to get people putting content into the same place. So British Council uh, and the BBC have just been partnering on something called Shakespeare Live and Shakespeare Lives, which is a kind of digital festival of Shakespeare content. And the idea is organisations who are doing things around Shakespeare 400 uh, will put things on the site, but this will become a kind of global showcase for, um, for uh, content from a number of partners around Shakespeare, uh, and it'll just be interesting to see how much traction we can get, how many people we can actually come into to Shakespeare Live. But that idea of pulling content into similar places that have an editorial proposition, I think, is something we're going to um, uh, going to want to do more and more. So I'm, I'm going to conclude. Um, I mean, so what do I think about the about the, the future? The, um, the sort of first thing is you sort of hear one click culture talked about a bit, and, and, the, and I, I sort of wondered for a while if the idea of it, if that vision of a kind of single single site where UK arts and cultural organisations can come together. I sort of wondered for a while if it was a bit of a El Dorado, but, but actually increasingly I think it's inevitable, and I think it's what we're going to um, um, need to do. And this is just a mock up around what that how that might begin to work around the Edinburgh festivals, for instance, at that time of year. Um, I also think there's something to be said for uh, creating a single ticketing service, because most organisations have their own ticketing serv um, services, which is you know, rather confusing from an audience point of view, and sort of cumbersome and, um, uh, and, and ultimately expensive. And, it, and you can sort of see that there's an argument that we all start combining on, on how we do ticketing. And you can see that we get to a place where there is a single site for uh, share our content and ticketing, as well as everyone else's and individual sites. But we have a kind of shared place where, for, for sort of curious arts enthusiasts, can just go to and, and find things. And I think it, uh, if we don't sort of collectively do it as a, as a sector, we're just going to see somebody else um, from, from abroad come in and do it. And, and so the more that we're thinking in this way, the better. And then inside of that, there's something around creating quite simple digital formats that could be used by anyone who is part of that part of that service. So that you just have a limited number of formats which uh, organisations just can sort of have and use. I just pulled up as an example BBC Live. Um, BBC Live was the tech that was developed for uh, the Olympics and, and for Parliament. And, it's you know, it's quite a sophisticated piece of tech where the whole science is sort of changing around. And you know, I've always thought I've only ever seen it really used on uh, events and um, uh, 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 you know elections and things. 
But you start to think what some arts organisations might do with something like BBC Live. The idea of you know the opening at, uh, at the Whitworth say when that be open last year, or what the performance might start to look like when you have bits of video going on, the social media rolling up the side of the page, and so <coughs> you just start to design around that as well, around how we around how we start to kind of share and organise this tech. That's it. Those are my uh, those are my thoughts uh, and reflections. Um, yes. Questions. Thanks, Tony. That was great. In half an hour, you went through an updated space and all the ideas about such the wealth of stuff that's going on in the BBC. I mean, you know, in terms of doing, there is a lot there, but when you actually bring it together. And see, you just speak how rich and uh, fulsome both of you So I'm sure there's some questions. Just kind of looking at going to phase two, but I just thought I'd kind of share that with the wider group, and if anyone wants to know more, then I'll do it. Just started. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Mark, you know, I'm, I'm in a rather minority. I'm one of Britain's leading glass collectors. It's a very, very well-known, very under-promoted, very under-recognised. And I just wonder to what extent Arts Online is looking at people like St. Potter's or that sort of area and able to provide a you know, an outlet for particularly people who are doing really good work. I think Get Creative is, is, is what we've been starting to, to, to do there. So Get Creative, so when we see two a few months back, the, um, the great pottery showdown, we teamed up with the Arts Council very quickly began to get sort of content around making going on, throwing off the back of those programmes. Uh, and apparently there's quite a pick-up in terms of attendance at workshops. But we're also able then to kind of share stories and what more people have done. So that to me is what Get Creative is about. It, it, it's about celebrating everyday creativity and sort of grassroots. And have you done any work with the craft council? Yes, sorry, that, that's what I meant to say. What did I say? The arts council. No, no, it's kind of with the craft council. That's interesting. I might follow you up. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask with this idea of, because when I work for a touring company, one of the problems we have is audience data, because a lot of the time we have data protection, we can't access the data that belongs to the venues that we visit. So while we can find out about audience that come to our work online, it's hard for us to find out about the actual physical audience mm. for our work. So I was wondering if you were thinking about this um, national ticket system, if there would be also some thought about how the data of audience data could then perhaps be shared amongst all arts organisations. Yeah, so, so I don't talk about taking things completely way behind on that, and somebody's already doing it, which is great. Um, but there's a, you know, there's an argument that's quite an interesting one which is being explored, which is if you take the BBC homepage, which generally for a long time you went there and you would just get the same stuff. So if you're interested in, in sport, which I'm not, you still get to put this stuff there. But what the BBC is doing is rolling out a login system, so when you log in, it starts to personalise around you and the foregrounds the content you're interested in. Uh, and, there's, and there's an argument which is what happens if you start to federalise that a bit. So that if you're an arts lover like me and you log into your BBC account, you'll then get BBC content around the arts, but you might get headlongs latest production or something there that you start to... And, and what that enables you to do is that in... In my BBC, we're able to start collecting data. So it's, take, it's been quite a sensitive thing to and happen to show that we're not going to abuse that data. But that's where it gets quite interesting because you can start to, if through my BBC you can then start to track track data around audiences and share that with arts organisations who are involved, you can start to understand the audience better. So if you're a website for an opera company, you'll know that anyone coming to the website loves opera, but you might not know much else about them. And there's something around how we have a kind of federalised data system that you can start to track uh, the diversity of people's interests. So um, I don't think we're there yet, but it's definitely a live, a live subject because it's such an important one for all of us. I think the audience agency already do quite a lot of that, okay. um, and they do a lot of talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Well, if I can just push in a plan, hopefully this will be one of the topics of our May IT for Arts. The audience agency with uh, Arts Council and Roger Tomlinson have come out with the, these new instructions for the, it, I should call them regularly funded organisations anymore, there's a, a new term for it. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, and we're going to get one of, the, one of the three of them to come and speak about exactly this. So, wait and see. I'm not very optimistic that it's a clear answer. <coughs> Things have moved further on. So, one last question for me. Um, yeah, coming back to the, another question on the crafts, also in terms of these platforms, because they have a lot of power as to what they promote and don't promote, um, the examples you gave before. Uh, particularly maybe around the space, sort of ballet, it's Shakespeare, and it's all the sort of the big established arts. And I'm wondering how much interest there is. And I know the BBC, I think, ten, uh, you know, there is, the director general has made a, an announcement initially about wanting to promote Shakespeare and that sort of side of the arts. To what extent there's an interest to bring in a more marginal kind of other art forms and even hand out a, a kind of a have more shared voice or kind of an agency within this kind of platform to promote other kinds of practices. Uh, do you mean about BBC services or about the space? Well, your arts um, platform. Um, well, I think you'd have to. So it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be one, it wouldn't be, I mean, there's some trick around that is who runs it, who editorialises, mm -hmm. right? So that would, um, and I, it, it's, it's, that's not there for you, know, that's just something for me to sort of, um, just sort of, um, you, you know, say I think it would need to be worked through. But I think it would be very important that it doesn't just become a kind of stomping ground for the safari big five of the arts establishment world. Um, and the idea, and certainly the provision of the space now, is that it's there as a fund which is, can, can enable organisations who often can't afford to do that stuff. The idea is that they could do those things. So in the modern it's about 1984, but it's probably not something they would have been able to just film on their own in that way. So that was quite a good example of uh, you, you know, an organisation being able to do something they might not be able to do. And hopefully that will diversify more and more and more. Thanks, John, for that. That was great. Thanks for taking the questions. You. And um, yeah, hope you all do as well. And if you are successful in some of these ventures. Thank you.